Hello, and once again, thank you for letting me speak to you today. Um, try and give you some sort of insight into farming in Northern Ireland. Um, as you know, I'm Richard Orr. We farm at Meadow Farm just outside Downpatrick. Um, we have several plots of land, and we rent lots of land off neighbouring farms. Um, because lots of the land now in Northern Ireland isn't actually owned by the farmers, it's it's owned by landlords. So just to give you a wee bit of background on our farm before we, we delve into the more important bits of food. Um, it's a traditional farming family for many years, where my mother and father and I have been farming. I came home to farm in 2008 full time after four years working for a, a neighbouring farmer part time after I left school. Uh, I did study at Down High and left with two A's at A level, but I always wanted to be a farmer. In 2018, the emphasis really was on trying to build something sustainable to allow me at least to get a, a wage to rear my family and, and build my own home as time progressed. So we developed <clears throat> from 2014 to 18 the addition of a tea room onto our farm shop to, to encourage footfall from younger customers because it, it's becoming very clear that um, the younger generation won't, don't and can't use fresh local food anywhere near to the level they should. Um, ready meals, pre-packed stuff, um, microwaves uh, it's become very important uh, in their line of of lifestyle so we needed something to encourage the younger generation in to our farm shop um, and see if we could encourage them to buy that fresh produce that technically we have grown on the farm and are looking for a market for um, and the addition of the tea room doubled the turnover through our farm shop in the very first year which was excellent um, but as I've said we've had to cope with um, COVID and cost of living since that which has had its ups and downs on the farm itself, we're farming about 150 hectares, which is um, not short of 400 acres um, in old money. But we only own 50 of those hectares, so we only own a third of the land we rent. As I've said, a lot of the land in Northern Ireland is now owned by landlords, and we rent that in Conacre every year to uh, grow our crops and, and raise our animals. The main crops on the farm at the moment would be wheat and potatoes. Those are our two uh, biggest crops and our two um, most profitable crops, let's say, um, to sustain the business. But you need a good rotation in crops to make sure that all crops function properly in your rotation. So we have wheat, which is sold for animal feed and also for uh, making flour in our, or well, we make the flour ourselves and then use it in the farm shop and bakery. We have winter barley, which at the moment generally goes for animal feed. There is markets at the moment growing for outlets for malting barley to produce whiskey with the, the thriving whiskey industry in, in the local area. We grow oats, as I've said before, which go to White Speedy Cook, um, and then they turn them into porridge oats and are resold as a local, local food product. The potatoes, 95% of those are retailed through our farm shop direct to the customers or used within the uh, the tea room itself as chips and potatoes. We also uh, do grow some silage uh, for an anaerobic digester, which is basically the same grass we grow to feed our cattle, but <clears throat> we're using um, and selling it to a local AD plant to produce electricity because unfortunately in the farming circles, there's more return growing that grass for to produce electricity than there is for the rear animals um, and get a return of, of profit from the meat that way. So we have a farm shop and tea room where we developed the farm shop initially 23 years ago to try and sell our farm produce direct to the customer and cut out the middleman as we would call it or the, the processor or the wholesaler um, to try and bring some more of that income direct to the farm business. We renovated the farm shop in 2018 when we put on the addition of the tea room, um, which has been quite successful, but we've had to struggle with 
COVID and cost of living all rolled in in three out of the four years that we've actually been open. Um, we have a vast range of fresh local fruit and veg from our own farm and <coughs> neighbouring farmers. But as you can see, we have an ever increasing line of ready meals, which unfortunately seems to be the way society is heading. We grow potatoes and, and root vegetables mainly on our farm to supply the farm shop, stuff that has a slightly longer shelf life um, due to the nature of a lot of vegetables being pulled today, sold tomorrow, and if not used within a few days, um, they've lost their best or their, their sell-by date or they ripen past their best. We're also continuing to develop a line of wheat at the moment for flour that we can use in our bakery, in our breads and scones, and then we're selling it as well, direct to the customer, so it's local homegrown wheat. And we also supply whites, Speedy Cook in Tandragi with oats that we grow on the farm, and then they turn those into porridge oats, which are, are, are stocked then in, in local shops again, which is another, another sustainable food product. On the farm, we use quite a lot of technology. Um, Farming now is big business, and it has to be very efficient, very well-run business. Um, because we're constantly driven down in costs, and as we're hearing at the moment, and we'll talk a bit more later about the fact that everybody thinks food's too expensive. Food, in by no means, is too expensive. Food is very cheap, and as a result, farmers are having to be more efficient every week, every year, to try and sustain themselves in a job to produce this food for to allow our nation basically to survive because we need a farmer three times a day to put food on our table. So some of the most important ones we use is soil analysis. That tells us what nutrition and what value is in our soil. The soil is the most important asset we have as a farm. Uh, it's very, very hard to regenerate the soil. It takes time. They don't produce any more of it but it can be damaged quite easily. So we have to look after the soil and the better the nutrition in the soil, the better our plant will grow. Um, and we do lots of checks on our plant counts and how our plants are doing throughout the year. Um, and Skippy Scout drone software is one of the ways now that we have been trialing along with the company that are developing it to take photographs, images, videos of our crops from the sky, a bit like satellite imagery to allow us to see from more distance and pick out um, maybe poor spots in a field or better or spots so that we can analyze why some are underperforming um, and try and improve those areas focus on the poorer parts to to level out our our yield or the amount of crop we take off that land because at the end of the day the more we can take off the more likely we are to return a profit as a business um, that leads into the NDVI technology, which we can get free through satellite imagery online. Um, and it takes images throughout the year of the fields. Um, and then we use those different colors, basically, to see if we can highlight problems within within fields and areas and crops, etc. In renewable energy, we have solar panels on the farm. Um, and they basically are used in a roundabout way to provide the energy to run our huge refrigerator to store the potatoes over the winter and then in the summer they power the grain dryer to dry the moisture out of our wheat or barley or oats to allow it to store um, and keep without spoiling. So that has drastically <coughs> reduced our uh, electricity bill and is much beneficial in terms of our environmental footprint through the energy we're using. Um, which is great from that point of view. We also use FarmBench, which is an online software program where we input all our figures, everything from buying a magazine to paying our insurance, buying a new tractor, um, and that goes against the crops and our, our whole farm business so that we can see how we're performing and areas maybe where we can improve. These figures are then all benchmarked against other like-minded farmers who input their data. Um, we then share that information to see if one can improve from the other and be more efficient because unfortunately, cost of living, the price of most stuff has risen, 
but us as farmers aren't necessarily seeing the return in a lot of areas. Potatoes, for example, are exactly the same price they've been this last five years. They may have went up slightly in the supermarkets, but to the wholesaler or us selling them in the farm shop, we're returning the exact same money, but our input costs have greatly increased, so we're always trying to find efficiencies that way. The other thing on the farm is we integrate our crops a lot. We don't grow just one crop in the same field continuously. That doesn't work. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for the wildlife. It's not good for the soil. It's just not a sustainable method. Whereas there's many parts of the continent and South America, Canada, where they just grow wheat to produce flour or to produce animal feed. And they just grow it continually. And that's why you see these large barren areas that are very little wildlife. And we're importing our food from those countries on a regular basis. Every day of the week, boats arrive because either we can't produce enough here or we're not paid enough to encourage the farmer to increase their production to produce more. You know, my average field size on the farm is only about five acres. If you go to America, they talk about sections and square miles, and each square mile is 320 acres, if I remember correctly, and you'll not see a hedge, a tree, or anything in that area, because um, they're all about mass production and efficiency. And we can understand why, because they have to produce it as cheaply as possible, because the consumer doesn't want to pay more for food. Um, so the consumer and has a choice there. Do they want to pay more? for food which will sustain the environment or do they want to buy the cheapest food possible and in turn the environment suffers. On our farm <clears throat> we have thriving wildlife, ladybirds, bees, butterflies. We use a lot of IPM um, which is integrated pest management. In areas where it's too steep to farm or too awkward to grow a crop or maybe the land's a bit poor. We plant those areas in wildflowers, um, in clovers, in anything that will benefit insects and wildlife. And that is wildlife and insects also benefits us because if we have enough, as we call, beneficial insects, they will eat our aphids and our predators that can damage our crops. Um, and as a result, we haven't used any insecticides, so any chemical sprays to harm wildlife on the farm in over seven years completely. And it's about 12 years in our grain crops, so our wheat, our oats, but in um, potatoes, it's seven. We, we have to be very careful with the potatoes that we introduced it a wee bit slower because in the summer when aphids are very prevalent, they can do a lot of damage to the potato crop and unfortunately the yield would be so that we wouldn't make a return. We also do a lot less cultivation on the farm now. We don't routinely plow. We try to have cover over the soil and we try to, re to work the soil less and use the crops in the rotation to improve the soil and allow us um, to work it that way. This is benefits to soil health and, and fungi and microorganisms living within there. Um, and long term hopefully will be beneficial to the farm. That emphasis on looking after our soil and looking after the environment has meant we have invested heavily over the last number of years in machinery to help us do that. The machine on the left on the back of the tractor was an investment of about 35,000 of new technology that had just come out that could help us plant our potatoes by moving the soil a lot less, maintaining its structure, to stop it sort of washing away and seeing these brown stains of soil on the road, etc. when there was heavy rain. And that has worked very well. And then after five years, we upgraded it to the one on the right, which is a double one, which has allowed us to be a bit more efficient and, and do it a bit quicker. It was just a slow process the other way. Uh, it was more beneficial to us, but it was slow, so it was very time consuming and the weather aspect of Northern Ireland keeping up with that was an issue. So we invested in the one on the right, which has been a brilliant asset to our soil, to our crops and to us as an efficient business. But that was an investment of, of, of just shy of £80,000. 
um, just to plant one crop. Um, and unfortunately in today's society, the ethos of cheaper and cheaper food, it's very, very hard to justify these investments. And it has to be on an efficiency basis. It has to be on save us, saving us money. Um, that tractor and machine sitting there is over a quarter of a million pounds worth of equipment. And unfortunately, people don't see that in today's society. It's, it's, it's a big money business. There's a lot of money tied up to make a small profit. Um, but it has been beneficial and um, continue to be. And just like that, some of the other technologies there we've invested in and in, in GPS that has allowed us to get our potatoes planted perfectly straight, perfectly accurate, perfectly efficient, and allow us to leave space, as you can see in the left there, between the potatoes to drive down with wider tires on our machinery, uh, not to compact the soil and cause issue and, and leave hard ground for surface runoff and erosion of soil and stuff. Um, but again, that's a massive investment. But again, um, establishment wise again just like the potatoes we're doing the same with our wheat and our oats and our arable crops as you can see in this field here we're five years into a establishment trial as we call it it's 12 different ways of establishing the same crop in the same field in these square plots we analyze the variations and the differences um, to try and see over a long term what's the best for me on my farm uh, to be the most efficient way of growing that crop, to be the best for the soil environment, take all those factors into consideration um, and see how we get on. And we are starting to see some similarities and some ones that are working really well and some that aren't working so well and some that we think or are told by the machinery salesman or the agronomist that they would be great isn't always the case because at the end of the day they're trying to line their profit by selling you something doesn't necessarily mean it works so again we're being scientific on farm we're doing all these tests all this analysis from soil moisture um, yield uh, soil microbiology fungi and uh, benefits to see the long-term effects so um, it really is a, a wide approach that you have to take just to plant a crop today if you're going to be efficient and do it with the environment in mind. And I think this slide kind of sums up how farming has to work. Um, this is the rows between the potatoes where we drive with our sprayer to apply chemicals. But those rows don't be very efficient in growing potatoes because of the wheel marks. We have therefore planted those in wildflowers, in clover, in stuff beneficial to the soil and beneficial to insects. And that result means that we're working with nature and providing something to keep that environment and keep that wildlife happy. But we are still having to apply chemicals to kill fungus within the potato crop, as I'm sure, well, maybe not now. A lot of younger people wouldn't know about the potato famine there was years ago in Ireland that basically caused the malnutrition of lots of people because the potato crop failed due to a blight fungus that wiped out the crop and wiped out basically the food for the Irish people. And we still have to spray to, to battle against that. If we let that in, it, it could be very detrimental. So we apply certain chemicals to keep that fungus at bay, but we don't apply anything that's going to be harmful to the insects. And we're now providing food for the insects to keep them happy um, and then if they're happy they'll in turn eat uh, the insects that we don't necessarily like. So that's nature and chemicals and farming all trying to work in the one circle and that's what a lot of local Northern Ireland farmers are now doing. They're, they're combining that all together. You won't see those wildflower strips in the fields of Argentina or Brazil or America. Um, it's about planting every inch there and we're importing a lot of our food from there because it is maybe cheaper or because nowadays for the government it ticks a box. The government doesn't regard it as having a carbon footprint if it's produced outside of our country, which is completely wrong. Yet local homegrown sustainable low food miles food 
in government's terms is classified as having a higher footprint and environmental impact than stuff we're importing from halfway around the world. It's just them trying to tick a box to hide figures for G7 and all this political rubbish, in my opinion, as a farmer. Um, but yes, we have to work with both. And that idea that we can all be organic and all produce enough food to feed the world isn't a reality, unfortunately. Um, and we need a balance of both. So if we look at that then um, on market and on profit, as the farmer would see it, you know, is food expensive? In the 1950s, the average household spent a third of their income on food. By the 70s, that had dropped to a quarter. The turn of the millennium, that had dropped to one tenth of your household income was spent on food. And today, it is still close to that. It'll have risen slightly, obviously, with the cost of living and yes, certain elements of food, like butter and stuff, is up massively. But that's not as a result of the farm price go going up massively. That's a result of the processor's cost of electricity, etc., putting the price up. But in basic terms, you no know, food is cheaper than it's ever been. You know, we're spending ten percent of our income on food. Um, and our grandfathers spent 33% of their income on food. You know, we need food three times a day to feed us. And if we want sustainable food, that comes at a cost. But it's clear that the public doesn't want to pay that. And, and that's because priorities have changed. We're in a society now where everybody wants to socialize, everybody has to go on holidays, everybody wants a new car, the latest iPhone, iPad, kids get thousands of pounds spent on them every Christmas. It's not that people have no money to spend on food. In my opinion, and from a farming point of view, and I see it from both sides because we retail through the farm shop, the general public spend, overspend on luxuries in life rather than prioritizing their mortgage, their food, and their health. Everything else after that should be based on what income you've left over. But I think because perception and priorities have changed, I'm very much driven by media and personalities within celebrity world, etc. Everybody wants to have everything now and it should be a given right that their food and their house and their clothing should nearly basically be provided and they can spend their money on, on luxuries. And I think that perception has to be changed and it starts right back at school in many ways, understanding the importance of food, understanding the importance of healthy food and home cooked fresh food instead of all this pre-packed, processed, heavily chemically filled food that will sit on a shelf for two weeks and not go off. And that, in my opinion, and in farmers community's opinion, that's where a lot of our illnesses and cancers come from. It's not from the core food you eat, it's the additives in it. But, you know, the problem is now people don't know how to cook. I see it in the farm shop over the last number of years. And you always see it at Christmas and summertime. School students, university students, home. Mummy or granny sent me to get the shopping. Uh, here's the list, can you help me? And at that you gasp and you think, what do you mean? Take a basket, fill it. And they say, I don't know what the food looks like. I'm only ever used to seeing it in one of those packages processed, ready to eat. They have no perception, they have no understanding now of where their food comes from, how it's produced and what it takes to grow that food and the importance of that. It's just not there. The media influence on how the public and the housewife perceives the cost of food was no more highlighted than the Loose Women program on TV last week. Um, I was in for my lunch, it popped up across the screen of the TV. 
what do you want from your local supermarket? And the consensus was they wanted more choice. They wanted to spread out over a wider area where they could sample the stuff before they bought it and maybe have a wee coffee while they were there. Well, that was for traditional farmer's market, but they were all priced out by low-priced supermarkets, which meant they all closed and disappeared and that hub of the community disappeared. And they just highlighted that with their next answer. And more importantly, we want cheaper prices. But as I've said, food's never been as cheap. Um, and for us to be able to grow local, fresh, sustainable food, that is all we hear. We need to be better to the environment. We need to do X, Y, and Z. Local food and local farmers tick lots of boxes to be farm quality assured, red tractor approved, board BIA accessed, have all the qualifications. And that all costs us more time and money. But we're not getting a return for our product. And in many ways, it's very hypocritical because we have many areas of industry and civil service and media on the TV every day that we need a pay raise for X, Y, and Z sector. And fair enough, if they need a pay raise or that's believed to be needing a pay raise. But those very same people that are protesting uh, and demonstrating and looking for a pay raise, they're not willing to pass that down the line and give the people producing their food a pay raise. You know, it's a whole circle. There's no point in saying fair price for, f for fair pay for a fair day's work if it doesn't get passed down the line to the next person. Why are farmers not entitled to a fair price for a fair day's work? And that is one of the big reasons why we have such a per uptake in agriculture. To me, there's other reasons as well, but one of them is it's seen as a lot of hard work for very little income. It's an excellent way of life, but the return for the risk v reward is not there. Maybe unfortunately for me, I'm addicted to farming. I've grown up with it, it's in my blood. Um, and I will be taking over the family farm, hopefully very shortly as my mother and father are retiring from the partnership. Fortunately, they've been in the process of getting divorced, so that is brought on at early, and at 37, I will be the sole owner and manager of our farm business, which is kind of unheard of in agriculture with the average age pretty much worldwide, never mind UK and Northern Ireland. The average age of a farmer is now over 60. So there's a big influence on the likes of yourselves within education of how we're going to encourage wide-minded, educated, highly motivated young people with a great skill set to run and manage a massive, complicated business. And it'll take people like that. You know, we need chemists to understand the chemicals and how to best use them. We need a mechanical engineer to fix and repair the machinery. We need a biologist to understand the, the soil, our most important asset, and how it will grow crops best. We need vets to manage the animals and, and maintain their welfare. And more importantly, which I think is where farming struggles at the moment, especially given the average age, is we need people with business skills to sell their product, to sell themselves, to understand what it is to be a business, make money, make profit, and sell your product or yourself. We really, really do lack that. Um, and we need you to educate young people and bring them into the industry to move it forward because we need them and their parents and the wider society to understand the importance of food and that without food, we don't survive. At the end of the day, we need a farmer three times a day to put food on your table. So I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening. It's been a wee bit of a whirlwind tour and I've <laughs> had to trim it down a few times to try and fit it into the time scale. But I hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much for listening.